Okay, we should be live. Let me just double check this. Yes, so we are live. Okay, so let's start. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, Valongo Seminars. I'm Luan Gezi. I'm the organizer of the seminars. And also we have Douglas Brambila, who is also our organizer, Ariana Cortesi. And today we have the help of Aline Novais, who makes uh, this beautiful art that you see on our uh, advertising material. So today we have the huge, huge honor of having Professor Sarah Seeger with us. So welcome, Sarah. I will briefly uh, uh, talk about your bio. So Professor Sarah Seeger uh, is at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the famous MIT and she's a professor of planetary science, physics, and aerospace engineering, and holds the class of 1941 professor chair. She's originally from Toronto, Canada, and has pioneered many now foundational research areas of characterizing exoplanets with present focus on the search for life by way of exoplanet atmospheric biosignature gases. She was the PI of the JPL MIT CubeSat Asteria, Deputy Science Director of the MIT-led NASA Explorer Class Mission TESS, now on orbit, and a lead of the Starshade Rendezvous Mission, a space-based direct imaging exoplanet discovery concept under technology development. Among many other accolades, Professor Seeger was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Science in 2015, is a 2013 MacArthur Fellow, has an honorary PhD from the University of British Columbia, and has asteroid 1997-29 named in her honor. Professor Sarah, welcome to our uh, seminars. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. And it's a great, great pleasure and great honor to have you here with us. So please go ahead whenever you're ready to start your talk. Thank you so much, everyone, and good afternoon. So I'm here to tell you about exoplanets and the search for biosignature gases. A few billion years ago, the humble cyanobacteria did something amazing. They discovered photosynthesis, and this bacteria was able to harness sunlight to get energy, and in the process, pumped out oxygen gas. Today, our atmosphere is filled with oxygen to 20% by volume. Without life on our planet, we would have no oxygen. So I love to think about intelligent aliens with the kind of telescopes we're hoping to build. If they discover Earth and see oxygen, wow. First, they'll probably be fighting over data analysis <laughs> or if the oxygen is even really in our spectra. But those aliens will know that oxygen shouldn't be in our atmosphere. It needs to be continually produced because it's so reactive. And they might even be able to associate oxygen with life on Earth. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find planets whose atmospheres we can study and, and look for gases. So today I'm going to, have, going to have a somewhat general introduction. Then my talk will get a bit more complicated. I think many of you want to hear the very latest on the phosphine on Venus. It's literally changing on a daily basis, but I will tell you where we are today. And then I'll return to talk more about exoplanets. So in the search for planets, since you're all astronomers or students, you know that all the stars in our sky are a sun and that our sun has planets. So the other stars do also, and we have found, found thousands of planets. So oddly, we haven't really found any or many true solar system copies, but it's still in our heart's desire to try to find another earth. Now, an earth, isn't necessarily like the faintest thing we've ever observed, not fainter than the faintest galaxies observed by Hubble. But the problem is that our Earth is so tiny compared to a sun. Our Earth is 100 times smaller than our sun, 300,000 times less massive, and 10 billion times fainter. 
So if we were together in the room, I would ask you to raise your hands. You can still do that even where you are now. And imagine for a moment that you drop everything to work on exoplanets. And if our host Luan is your advisor, he will assign you a uh, choice. And you could choose to work on a method that involves finding an Earth by planet size. Would you do that? Our Earth is only 100 times smaller than our sun. Or would you choose a method that involves planet mass? That's a lot harder because our Earth is 300,000 time, times less massive. Or would you choose, this is actually my favorite one, to find an Earth in reflected light. Our Earth is 10 billion times fainter than our sun. Like no matter how you look at it, it's really hard to find another, another Earth. So if I could see all of you, I'm guessing most of you would have voted, I don't know if you're, you wanna take the easy way out or not, <laughs> but I don't know if you want to take the easy way out or not, but most people vote for the easiest way to find another Earth by size. And I think a lot of you know this already, but it's the transit technique. The transit technique is when the planet goes in front of the star as seen from the telescope. As you can see on the top, it's an artist's conception because we don't spatially resolve any stars like that other than our sun. And you see on the bottom, it's the brightness of the star uh, as a function of time and hours. And we're looking for that tiny, tiny drop in brightness that signals the planet going in front of the star. This is the main way we find exoplanets today. And the test, MIT-led NASA mission tests, we find like 100 new planet candidates a month. You can ask me more about tests in the, in the question and answer if you want. So to make our life even easier, um, astronomers are, let's say, taking an even easier path because we're looking for transiting small planets, not just for Earths around a sun-sized star, but an Earth around a red dwarf star. And you can see in this real, we have a real image of our sun and I've superimposed a fake black dot, a fake image of an Earth-sized planet. And if you look at on the right, there's a fake image of TRAPPIST-1, a red dwarf star. The same Earth is there. You can just see how much more area it takes out. So the drop in brightness for Earth and Sun, the planet star area ratio is one part in 10,000. For TRAPPIST-1, it's only one part in 100. So this whole field, if you're not working on exoplanets, I want you to know that like a good fraction of the field is pushing, pushing, pushing to find lots and lots of small planets. Actually, they're pushing to find to study lots of stars, red dwarf stars looking for transiting planets. We have like a handful of, of really good ones. So what I'd like to do now is, as part of this introduction is to um, take you on a, like a journey to one of these planets orbiting a red dwarf star. I have this artist conception here and uh, this artist conception shows that, well, the first thing to note is that the red dwarf stars give off very little energy they give off very little energy. So a planet that is suitable for life, or if we could like visit, the planet has to be relatively close to the star because that star gives off very little energy. It might be that the star is very big in the sky. This artist exaggerated that a little bit. We don't know much about the atmospheres. The artist has used the artist license here. But what I think is really interesting is the planets are close enough to the star, the ones in the habitable zone, that they're tidally locked. They rotate one time for every time they orbit, just like the moon shows the same face to Earth at all times. So you all know that about the moon, but what you might not realize is that if we could go to this planet, it means that one part of the planet um, is always in day and one part is always in night. In other words, the star or the sun, it's actually always in the same part of the star at all times. That's actually not strictly true because there's some libration going on, but in general, you could decide where would you visit? Where it's always day? No, no you wouldn't because you're astronomers. You would wanna go where it's always night so you could do astronomy. So, you know, on second thought, visiting these types of planets around M dwarf stars could be a terrible idea. You know how we're always glued to our phones? Well, the high energy radiation that frequently flares and, and comes off the star, these M dwarf stars, it would like knock out those electronics. What kind of um, sunscreen would we wear? These M dwarf stars, honestly, it's easier to find planets around. But in the community, there's like a huge debate as to whether or not they're really the right places for life. Our sun, of course, gives off flares. Um, we have 
big flares. Um, we have this one incredible event that, that I hope if you haven't heard about this, you must go and read up about it. It's called the Carrington event. And what happened in 1850, in, around 1850, a British astronomer named Carrington, an amateur astronomer was, well, he was like that gentleman astronomer that's like self-funded. <laughs> he was uh, looking at the sunspots and he saw a couple of sunspots whiten. They brightened a little bit. And a day and a half later, our Earth became electrified. You know, you we could see northern lights almost down to the equator. I wonder if from Rio de Janeiro, they could see the northern lights at that time. But up here in northern no North America, apparently you could go outside and read a book by the northern lights. The We didn't have electricity, but the telegraphs wires caught fire. Now at the time, believe it or not, well at the time Maxwell's equations were not articulated yet and people didn't totally understand magnetic fields. But what happened was our sun had given off a coronal mass ejection which hurtled towards earth and that had a bit of magnetic field embedded in it. And that part of our sun hit our earth's magnetic field and induced a current. Why am I telling you all this? <laughs> because it's, uh, wow, it is pretty, pretty heavy duty. But it turns out that uh, NASA's Kepler Space Telescope observed TRAPPIST-1 for one of its um, K2 segments for 80 days. And astronomers counted 40, four zero flares. Although these flares are at the optical, they estimated that one of these flares was analogous to Earth's Carrington event. So imagine that if we were to visit this planet, a planet around a somewhat active M dwarf star, every 80 days we'd be subject to this giant flare event that could be completely destructive for, for, um, for life. That was kind of mean of me in a way because I'm like, oh, these are so terrible. <laughs> but these M dwarf stars are still our very, very best that we, we have to offer. So as part of my continued introduction, I'm just gonna briefly tell you about atmospheres and how, what is our, our most common way we observe atmospheres today. We actually, um, so those that you don't know this, I'm just gonna try to explain it for a moment because it is key to how are, as astronomers, our first chance to find signs of life on another planet. So you're seeing an artist's conception on the top right. And what you see is like a fake atmosphere that's glowing. And it's supposed to illustrate that as the planet goes in front of the star, the starlight shines through the atmosphere. And I'm gonna actually put this to you now that I want you to imagine looking at the transit the little drop in brightness due to the planet going in front of the star at a wavelength where the atmosphere is transparent. All the light goes through. The planet looks a certain size. But if you imagine now looking at the atmosphere at a wavelength where the atmosphere is opaque, there's a gas that's strongly absorbing. All of a sudden that planet looks a tiny, tiny bit bigger. And that's kind of what's behind the um, heart of the whole transmission spectroscopy. I just put that little equation down there so I could have at least one equation in my talk. lambert beer law, it's sort of the basics behind, you know, that light from the star goes through the atmosphere and is exponentially attenuated by gases in the atmosphere. I just wanted to show you a couple of examples um, because here's showing you now transit depth as a function of wavelength. And it's a bit awkward. It's like an upside down spectrum because we're showing you that the planet looks a tiny, tiny, tiny bit bigger at certain wavelengths where there is a gas that is strongly absorbing. Here you see transit depth as a function of wavelength. And if you look on the right half of the diagram, you'll see um, the near infrared. And the white points, the white solid points with error bars are from the Hubble Space Telescope, Wide Field Camera 3. And the lines are models. All you, ha you have to look at this and wow, the model, um, it's made to fit the data, but where that big feature is, is water vapor. And this is the detection of water vapor on a giant planet atmosphere, a hot giant planet atmosphere. It's just, if you can read off from the Y axis, you'll see it is a, a very small, small sign. And if you didn't understand everything I said, if you're not in exoplanets or maybe you're an undergrad, all you have to do is agree with me that this plot is different from a straight line. The planet size is changing as a function of wavelength and it indicates a, a planet atmosphere 
and it overlaps with, with water vapor. Here's another one where I've, I've now cherry picked the, one of the very, very best exoplanet spectra we have. It's showing you transit depth again, the drop in brightness as a function of wavelength. Now it's going from 0.3 microns out to five microns. The white points um, between one to two microns, again, those are with the Hubble Space Telescope Wide Field Camera 3, which wasn't designed for exoplanets. It just happens to be very stable and, and very good for exoplanets. You can see um, the water vapor features mentioned there. I highlighted this one. This is uh, one part in a thousand signal, which is incredibly high for exoplanets. It's because this planet, it's a hot Saturn planet with very low density and it has an incredibly puffy atmosphere, making it very suitable for observations. So today, we use the Hubble Space Telescope to study hot giant exoplanet atmospheres. We have some slightly smaller planets as well, um, but on the whole, we're somewhat exhausting what Hubble can do, and we can't really use Hubble to look at small rocky planet atmospheres. The signal's just too small. Although we've tried, we, the community has tried, we haven't, haven't found a lot. But the thing that everyone's excited about is our next generation telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, where we um, will repeat all the work being done for hot, hot exoplanets, pushing down to those small rocky exoplanet atmospheres. Now the James Webb, actually the proposals are due two weeks from now. So everybody's scrambling to get, get their proposal in. And its lifetime nominally is only five years. It'll be tricky because we need to look at multiple transits to, to get a, a good signal. There's also some debate as to whether or not James Webb really will be able to study small rocky planet atmospheres because the atmosphere is so small, like the skin of an onion on an onion. And this method, it'll only work for small planets around M dwarf host stars. And that's why I spent some time focusing on these M dwarf stars because they're small enough that we have a chance to study the atmospheres. So now I'm gonna move on to phosphine as a biosignature gas. This quote here is one of my guiding principles. I read it in a, a book about, uh, I guess it looks like it's 10 or 15 years ago. Nothing would be more tragic in the exploration of space than to encounter alien life and fail to recognize it. Now, of course, this doesn't mean um, meeting little green aliens that came to Earth and we somehow didn't see them. It's thinking about exoplanets and all the gases produced there. And if there's some kind of microbe producing a gas that we don't recognize as a biosignature gas, that will be really bad on us. Our Earth has only had significant atmospheric oxygen, significant like the 20% level for the past billion years. Although our Earth has been around for a few, um, 4.6 billion years. So I always, I try to think about what kind of gases might be produced by life on another world. What is something that is so incredible to me is that on our own planet, we have so many gases in our atmosphere that are made by life. Uh, motivated by a friend who asked me this question, what about life in Earth's atmosphere? And you can check this, it will take you a while if you don't believe me, but every gas in Earth's atmosphere to the part per trillion level, with the exception of noble gases, is actually produced by life on Earth. Although most of the gases are have a dominant source that's not life. So nitrogen gas, it's already in our atmosphere, but life produces that. Even ozone, believe it or not, is actually produced inside some cells. So all of this, this sort of quest for other gases, the thought about our own atmosphere, this led me to a crazy theory. I was wondering um, if I, if we were in the room, I would ask you, how many of you have, have received a crazy theory, like a physics theory from, from someone um, by email? Like if you're a professor in astronomy or physics, you definitely have received lots and lots of theories. They're usually like about gravity or I don't know, there, there are tons of them. Uh, if I was with you in the room, I would also ask you, how many of you have sent a crazy theory? Well, I had my own crazy theory. And that was um, that I thought initially, perhaps life produces all molecules 
all gases, all molecules that are in gas form. Because before I started thinking and studying chemistry, all the gases I could think of were actually made by life. Like I said, ozone even. So I, my, um, the funny thing is, is that like if you're the professor or the MIT professor too, like who do you go to? Well, I actually had to go to the next level up, which is a Nobel laureate. And I recruited a couple of biochemistry friends and we worked through some gases. We put a presentation together and there's this Nobel laureate in the physiology of medicine. His name's Jack Shostak. He's a supports astrobiology. He works in astrobiology. And we went to tell him the theory and he crushed the theory in literally like one minute. He found a counterexample, a small molecule in gas form that is simply never made by life. So it's kind of neither here nor there, but this kind of, this, this story is how I got started working through what we call chemical space. Just like space is defined by stars, chemical space is the space spanned by all possible molecules. And different types of scientists take different slices through chemical space. Like people working on drug discovery do this. They create molecules in their computer, like literally trillions of molecules or more. And then they slice through it in a certain way for drug discovery. Well, my team actually literally put together every single molecule in gas form at room temperature and pressure. And we also curated from sources all around the world, a database of products that life makes. You know, in the end, we found that about a quarter of all gases are made by life. It, it's really, unfortunately, neither here nor there. But here you see a sea of molecules in the distance representing all the molecules we could think of for uh, life on Earth, for biosignature gases. We have algorithms that's supposed to be represented by the filter that sort the molecules into some on the right side that go by a planet that we hope might be gases we should be ready to find in an exoplanet atmosphere. The ones on the left side are actually molecules never produced by life. So just one moment for a little tiny aside was this research, we found something we didn't really expect. And that is thanks to um, a brilliant postdoc at MIT. He's now a research scientist at MIT named Janusz Petkowski. And he found that there's actually some fragments of molecules, we call them motifs, that are never made by life or rarely, rarely or never made by life. That would be a whole separate talk, but it's an avenue of research we are pursuing. So back to biosignatures, um, I mentioned my talk would get a bit more complex, so you don't have to follow this whole thing to, to understand the rest of the talk, but we take these thousands of gases and do what we call a triage. I'm gonna walk you through this slide. I'm gonna get my laser pointer up here for a second. All right, so we're starting here at the top, all small molecules database. That's those thousands of gases. We actually try to see if they have spectra that exist already. Out of those, you know, 14,000 or so, literally only maybe 100 have good spectra and maybe 600 have some rough spectra. We then put the molecules or class of molecules through our atmosphere models, spectral simulator. And if we find that this molecule is not really detectable by the James Webb Space Telescope, we drop it. If it's detectable, but it's not distinguishable from other molecules, it also gets dropped. If the molecule kind of survives an initial triage, initial assessment, it basically gets to be evaluated further. And in this evaluation panel on the right side, the key is atmospheric chemistry. So if you want to study exoplanet atmospheres and the search for biosignature gases, the best advice I can give you is start learning photochemistry. It's extremely complicated. The computer codes, um, we have, we'll have like hundreds of reactions and maybe a hundred species. And the code, um, it's very, it doesn't wanna converge unless you give it a starting solution that's incredibly close to the final solution. So you have to like build up a library of solutions. There's only about three or four codes in the world really that work for this, this subject. And I would say maybe only two of those, including one on my team, works for what we call reduced atmospheres, atmospheres with hydrogen. And that's important because hydrogen rich atmospheres are puffy. And if they exist on rocky planets, they're our best chance to find signs of biosignature gases. So back to this plot, um, if it survives chemistry, it's good. If the um, gas 
it becomes a good potential biosignature. It's a bonus if life also produces that gas, and it's also a bonus if there's limited false positives. So when we started doing this, one of the very first gases of interest that came through, not only this triage system, but also what I was saying before, also what I was saying before for um, you know the gases that are rarely produced by life, the one that came of interest was phosphine. And this gas came to our interest from this giant list and from these sort of procedures. So my team started investigating phosphine as a biosignature gas. So it turns out that phosphorus is an essential element uh, for all life on earth and it's used by life as phosphate. You know, because our earth, we hardly have any hydrogen. So phosphorus wants to be in an oxygen related compound. Now phosphine appears to be almost completely absent from biology. And when we started working on this, uh, we found that there were a lot of art, there were arguments against phosphine as being produced by life. People said phosphine is so toxic and unstable. Uh, also, the kind of general opinion was there's no confirmed life producing instances. That's not just an opinion, actually, it's actually a fact. But it turns out that on Earth, um, there's incredibly strong evidence for, for phosphine as being produced by life. Although we haven't identified the exact species, phosphine is measured in the laboratory from complex mixtures of bacteria. It's also found in wetlands and sludges and generally oxygen-free environments, some oxygen-free environments. On Earth, phosphine is only associated with life. Either bacteria, like I described, or human-made as pesticides and other things. So it turns out that phosphine is only toxic and unstable. And by the way, it was used as a World War I chemical warfare agent. But it's only toxic and unstable in oxidized environments and to life that uses oxygen. So that we ended up writing some papers on phosphine and I'll come back to those towards the end of my talk. But right now I'm gonna to move to the topic of phosphine on Venus. So completely independent of my team's biosignature work pursuing phosphine, another astronomer, Professor Jane Greaves in the UK decided to, um, it's very, okay, so it's kind of crazy, but we have this phrase in exoplanets and the search for life. And that is the line between what is considered mainstream science and what is considered crazy. That line is constantly shifting. You know, so 25 years ago, you wouldn't invite a speaker to talk about exoplanets. It was just too crazy. Today, you not only invited me to talk about exoplanets, but the search for life in exoplanet atmospheres is like legitimate. So Professor Jane Greaves actually also helped shift this needle because she wanted to do something considered crazy, which is looking for life on Venus. And just like my team, she found the same kind of obscure papers that described phosphine as being only associated with life on Earth. So she proposed to the James Clerk Maxwell telescope to search for phosphine and got rejected, proposed another time, got accepted. And she had then observed phosphine or observed Venus for phosphine in the radio and came across a very weak signal. But at that point, because my team was also working on phosphine and giving talks about it, a mutual contact connected our teams. And we helped Professor Jane Greaves write a proposal to use the ALMA, um, ALMA telescope so that the weak feature in the James Clerk Maxwell telescope data, we could look for it with a more powerful telescope. So I'm not sure if we have any radio astronomers in the room. I'm not myself a radio astronomer, um, but ALMA is a really, really incredible facility. It's one of the, it's in the Atacama Desert in Chile, one of the highest and driest places on earth. It's actually the largest radio telescope in the world. It's made up of, um, I wanna say it's like over 60 antenna. 50 of them have uh, 12 meter diameters and it acts together as a single, telescope, an interferometer. Now, millimeter and submillimeter light is easily absorbed by water vapor. So this dry being so high up, it's really good for radio astronomy. So Venus, by the way, it has a massive carbon dioxide greenhouse atmosphere. Its surface is terrible for life, like no life could ever survive on the, on the surface of Venus. But people have speculated 
about life on Venus ever since Carl Sagan half a century ago. So it turns out on Venus, there are just like on Earth, as you move up away from the surface, the um, atmosphere becomes colder. And the theory about life on Venus is that it could exist in the clouds. Our own Earth actually has, has life in the clouds. It's bacteria that gets swept up and lives up in the clouds for about one week before it's dropped back down. But Venus's clouds are permanent. They're 100% permanent. They're extensive vertically. And the habitat, it's not transient like Earth's cloud. It's always there. So the thought is that there could be life living in the clouds of Venus inside the droplets. These droplets are not water though. They're incredibly harsh chemicals. They are sulfuric acid with a bit of water. It's, an, it's hard to imagine, honestly, that any kind of life could live there. Well, back to Venus. Um, here's the detection figure from the paper. Radio astronomers um, like to put their data into histograms. And the y-axis, you're seeing what is line to continuum ratio. Line to continuum ratio, so it's normalized. And the bottom, instead of showing frequency, it's in terms of Venus rest frame velocity. We can leave that as a homework problem for you to convert from frequency to velocity, but you know how to do this by, by the Doppler shift. So this is um, data of the phosphine one zero rotational transition. Like a lot of astronomers, we're used to working at optical or infrared, which is incredibly busy and very, very crowded with features. Out in the radio, there's not, much, not as much going on because the rotational lines are well separated. It, this phosphine line, there is a sulfur dioxide line, but it's really weak and not very well populated. And we're confident it can't be, it can't be mistaken for phosphine. So I just wanted to like walk you through why we made a claim of phosphine here. Because Venus, like looking for biosignature gases is really hard. You know, Venus is very bright. It's spatially resolved. It's actually challenging for nearly every type of ground-based instrument, including ALMA. And we had to push the sensitivity. We had to heavily, heavily analyze this data. But we do have this thing. I just wanted to like collect my thoughts for a second and explain it. But the question we asked ourselves is, given two spectra from independent observatories, ALMA and JCMT, they had different populations, different noise characteristics, way different. But they did share um, a spectral feature. So we asked ourselves, what is the probability that both spectra would show a negative feature at exactly defined frequency with a line width the same as predicted by models and that no other coincidences of other gases would occur. So like we can't really compute a, a probability like that. So we demonstrated each aspect of this in our paper, which uh, you can read. So that's why we, why we made a statement that we found phosphine on Venus. And what's also really interesting is that Phosphine shouldn't be on Venus. You know, like Earth, Venus is what we is, it has carbon dioxide and phosphine, it has almost no hydrogen. So phosphorus atom doesn't want to be with hydrogen atoms, wants to be with oxygen atoms. And we do have phosphine in our solar system. Jupiter and Saturn have phosphine because they have plenty of hydrogen and they have a high enough temperature and pressure at the bottom or beneath their atmospheres for phosphine to form. But on Venus, by the way, the temperatures and pressures and lack of hydrogen mean there's, there's no way, at least in chemical equilibrium, or at least thermodynamically, for phosphine to form. Now, what my MIT team contributed was we actually spent literally like two years working through all the different types of chemistry that might produce phosphine. And a lot of reactions are missing, by the way. Phosphine's not like a well like phosphine and a hydrogen in any environment, a lot of reaction rates are missing, but we work through everything. Volcanoes and surface minerals, lightning, meteors. And in every case we found that any, some, most of them had no phosphine, but any one that had some phosphine fell short by not just a few or 10 times, but usually by many orders of magnitude, um, the amount of phosphine that we, we found in Venus. These are all, there's like a lot here, that I won't have time to walk you through. But I do want to say that, you know, we were not claiming that we found life on Venus. We were claiming that we detected phosphine gas whose existence is a mystery. It's either unknown chemistry or like very speculatively, just very possibly life production. 
So if you're following this, especially if you're on Twitter, you will know that there's uh, been a lot of intensive scrutiny, which is what we expect. We encourage this. And there have been several papers out there analyzing the data, the radio data from Alma primarily, and saying there's no phosphine. One of the papers reanalyzed the James Clerk Maxwell telescope data and said there is a sign there. And I won't like go into detail here because we want this, but I did want to raise an issue here that um, one of our supporters, David Grinspoon, captured so eloquently. He, he said, you know, there may or may not be phosphine in Venus, but we definitely have evidence that some scientists are mean-spirited. And they're actually, like I love how eloquent David is. He says, collectively, we're searching, sometimes haltingly, for answers to deep questions about our solar system. Whether it's our solar system or exoplanets, this is a hard field. We're pushing the sensitivity of the instrument. We're trying to find something that is, is hard to find. But thanks to all this intense scrutiny, the ALMA Observatory went back to their data and found, let's say, a problem. If any of you work with Hubble data, or some of you work with test data, or any data from a big national or international facility, we usually give you, I'm speaking about the test mission for now that I've, I've worked closely with, we provide calibrated data. We also give you the raw data, but typically as astronomers, we just use the calibrated data from the big facilities. And Professor Jane Greaves team that I was on, you know, we also had ALMA scientists on our team. Well, what happened was they found a problem in the way that the data was calibrated. They used Callisto, one of Jupiter's moons, and there's two different modes to, to calibrate it in, and they use the suboptimal mode. So I said that the situation is changing every day. The ALMA data is being recalibrated. It's actually tomorrow that they're putting the recalibrated data out for the public. So I'm sure in the next few days we'll be seeing a lot, a lot going on. And I don't have any further comment on that right now. Just wow, this has been a crazy um, time. Incredibly exciting to see Venus um, get attention. And let's just see what happens. So in the meantime, there's something else that's, that's quite intriguing. That, the, that a scientist by the name of Rakesh Mogel, he looked back at Pioneer Venus data, which isn't easy by the way, and it turns out there's a 90-year-old man named Dr. Hodges who's still alive, who actually worked on Pioneer Venus. The instrument data that they looked at, um, people don't leave all the record. Like think about this today, that most of us use the archives of astronomy data. And there is archived data here, but things they want to know like capac uh, capacitance and voltage and other instrument parameters were not recorded. Well, what this team found was they found some evidence for phosphine in Venus's atmosphere at the same cloud deck level that our ALMA and JCMT data probed. Now it's from a neutral gas max mass spectrometer, so a probe that dropped down through Venus's atmosphere. And if you know what, a, um, like most of us don't know what a mass spectrometer is, but basically it ionizes materials and then subjects them to a magnetic field. And they each take a different path through that magnetic field. And they're able to somehow uh, resolve the mass and charge of that fragment. So there are a lot of different fragments that they found, and one of them is phosphorus ion, which if you read the paper or talk to the team, it is most likely only associated with phosphine gas because phosphine is the only gas, it's the only gas form of phosphorus atom in the Venus cloud layers. Like there's one little wrinkle here where some people think there could be phosphorus or phosphoric acid vapor but the team did not find any other fragments of those acids that they should have found. So that's uh, where we're at with Venus. And for the rest of my talk, I will move um, back to exoplanets. Now, exoplanet atmospheres are, are very complicated. Um, this field is being, the barrier to entry for this field is getting a lot lower though, because we're in this kind of modern day of open source code. But sometimes the codes aren't, tweaked properly for what you want to use, or sometimes they're a little complicated, but I think it's getting easier and easier. Typically what we think of is, um, you know, this kind of set of basic equations, conservation of energy, energy transport, hydrostatic equilibrium, ideal gas law, and there's the photochemical equilibrium again. 
Um, it's there's different thing. This I don't really have time to do any of this justice at all. I just want to say that if you want to work on exoplanet atmospheres, better start <laughs> reading those textbooks. There's sort of a lot to learn here, um, but it is something manageable in in a graduate student career. So. One thing we did was, I mentioned before, we studied phosphine as a biosignature gas. And here I'm showing you a simulated spectra for the James Webb Space Telescope. What you see here is transit depth on the y-axis. Okay, so it's a tiny, 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 tiny drop in brightness, change in brightness as a fun in transit depth, a tiny change in transit depth as a function of wavelength. And this is as a function of wavelength in microns. And my student, Zhu Cheng, who made this figure, he's highlighted in magenta or pink what the James Webb Nearspec instrument, where those wavelength ranges, and in green, what the infrared MIRI instrument would do, farther infrared MIRI instrument would do. What you're supposed to look at here is the difference between the two curves, the top spectral feature curve and the bottom spectral feature curve. And the top one is with um, a lot of phosphine. Um, and the bottom one is yeah, I think it's without phosphine. And there's sort of, this goes through a lot of different simulation codes, including um, noise with the James Webb Space Telescope would have. But anyway, don't worry too much about the plot. We found that phosphine can accumulate in an anoxic atmosphere. That's an atmosphere without oxygen, because oxygen is very destructive to phosphine on a very fast time scale. In fact, the type of planets we favor, if they exist, are rocky planets with hydrogen dominated atmospheres. These will have puffy atmospheres, easier to detect than their high mean molecular weight counterparts. And they also let, uh, would let phosphine gas accumulate. We love phosphine as a biosignature gas because it has no false positives that we know of. At any planet that has the right temperature and pressure to have liquid water oceans, phosphine is extremely unfavored thermodynamically, even kinetically for reaction pathways that are measured. In this red box here, this is kind of getting to one of the takeaways from my talk, is that for phosphine to be detected, it's not going to be a trace gas like on Venus. At Venus is like, you know, 10, 20 parts per billion. For an exoplanet, perhaps it's not surprising, but we need a re-engineering of the atmosphere. Like, remember I started my talk saying oxygen or cyanobacteria or bacteria re-engineered our atmosphere. If we want to have a hope, this is the formulation, the conclusion that my team is formulating. We're not 100% sure yet, but nearly every gas we look at, it looks like the atmosphere has to be re-engineered. Not just a little bit of gas, tons of it. And just to tell you a bit more about that, is we've looked at a few gases in detail right now, um, including phosphine. We have isoprene, ammonia, and these bars are showing you our biological surface flux required for the gas to accumulate in a very favorable planet atmosphere scenario. Now, by accumulate, we mean that it can withstand the photochemical sinks. That's really what it means. And if you look at the blue bar, which is for exoplanets in our models, and the yellow bar is Earth levels, like in each case for phosphine and isoprene and ammonia, we need so much more. I forgot to mention, this is a log scale. Don't worry about the actual values here, just comparative values. It's a log scale, so wow, we need many orders of magnitude more gas than Earth has, in some cases more than oxygen production rate on Earth. And I just want you to read this bottom right orange line, orange takeaway here. We found that this re-engineer of the atmosphere can happen if the biological gas can be produced at a higher rate than production of the destructive atmosphere fragments we call radicals. So you can almost compare the production of the gas compared to the actually number of ultraviolet photons coming in that sets off the chain of reactions that produces the radicals. So in our planet, yeah, we did this by photosynthesis. Hopefully these other planets can do it also as well. So we have an incredible future. Not only the James Webb Space Telescope on the top left, we have the giant Magellan Telescope and the extremely large telescope and the 30 meter telescope, huge telescopes now under construction. You can ask me the questions about Starshade, but we have these brand new telescopes either ready to go, being built or concepts that we hope can find um, biosignature gases. 
And for my final thought, I just wanted to leave you with one more thought here, that we do have this incredible future with our new telescopes. And we here, and some of you working on, on exoplanet atmospheres, we, we do have the first chance ever, the first capability to find signs of life on an exoplanet. But given how phosphine is unfolding right now, it gets started to really sink into me that it's going to be hard. We'll find a sign of life and maybe the data analysis will be redone and say we need more data. Maybe we'll never be sure that it's not a false positive. So if you're, let's say under the age of 30, <laughs> um, you, I want you to think even farther. And it's that, you know, the line between what is mainstream and what is crazy is constantly shifting. There are some amazing ideas out there of how we can literally go to the stars. There's an idea called Starshot. There's an idea called the gravitation, the Solar Gravitational Lens Telescope, where people want to send telescopes to 550 astronomical units. That's something like 50 billion miles away from here to use our sun as a gravitational lens and would be able to magnify a background planet to um, 10 kilometers spatial resolution. So we're doing uh, really well here in exoplanets. We have thousands of, of exoplanets that we know about. We have a way to kind of corral all the different possibilities for biosignature gases. We have computer programs that we can simulate what exoplanet atmospheres elsewhere look like. We have a next generation telescopes that give us our first capability for observing small exoplanet atmospheres for water vapor and biosignature gases. And, you know, even, and this phosphine discovery, regardless of where it goes, it will take some time for us to, to settle on, on the answer. But Venus is now what I like to call in our solar system, the new frontier, because the discovery of phosphine gas has, has renewed interest in Venus and the, this crazy possibility for life in the Venus clouds. Thank you, everyone. That concludes my talk. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah, for this amazing talk. And also, it, it was not a beautiful talk scientifically, but also visually. So thank you very much for that. And just so you know, you, you are not seeing the audience, but people to, uh, 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 said in the comments that yes, they had some people had received many crazy theories. So okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. that happens a lot here too. So. <laughs> You're not seeing the audience, but we do have some crazy theories uh, from around eventually. So we have uh, lots of questions. So if you do have any questions, please uh, put them on the chat. So I'll forward to Professor Seeger. So let's start with this question here from Tiago. He's a professor here at Valongo Observatory. And he wants to know about the perspectives for the study of exoplanet atmospheres with 30 meter class telescopes versus the, the JWST. Yes. Well, the JWST will study plan the small um, planets transiting red dwarf stars in transmission. So it's limited to those planets that fortuitously they're lined up just so, so they go in front of the star as seen from the telescope. The 30 meter telescopes have the chance to look at probably many more because they can do, um, well, they have to have the right instruments, which they don't have at first light, but they can do direct imaging where a coronagraph inside the instrument will block out the starlight so we can see planets directly. They have to have um, extreme adaptive optics, but with all of that together, they should be able to survey about a hundred M dwarf stars looking for a planet and they'll be able to get spectra in the near infrared at JHK as well. In terms of ERS, um, so a lot of the yeah best exoplanet candidates or a lot of them, there are already tied up. There's several different things, you know, on the James Webb, if you built an instrument, you get special time, reserve time. So those ones are observing transiting planets. There's a bunch of things like that as well. And we're hoping that a lot of these first projects can get the data out to the public so we can all figure out what we need to do to, you know, get down to high sensitivity. 
Okay, so I will take the opportunity to ask you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Starshade Rendezvous mission? Yes, that's what I really want to talk about. I'd rather just give the entire talk on Starshade. So I have some backup slides here on pretty much everything, but let me go to Starshade. So the concept is we'd like to go to space and block out a star so we can see the starlight directly. But I just want to say that transits, you know, they're just part of a very long story because they have to, first part, they everything has to be aligned. But for Starshade, the goal is to have a giant screen and to block out starlight so we can see planets directly. Because of diffraction, Starshade has to be a very special shape. But I just want to show this animation, then I'll answer the question. Starshade has to be a special shape, and these petals would unfurl from a stowed position. The central truss would snap into place. Starshade would have its own spacecraft, and it would have to uh, formation fly. Starshade is tens of meters in diameter, and it would formation fly tens of thousands of kilometers from its telescope. It's a pretty crazy idea. Yeah, this was so crazy, it was first thought of in the 1960s by Lyman Spitzer. And he actually, uh, the Starshade was revisited every decade and since then, actually, until now, we think we can actually really build Starshade. Now, Starshade Rendezvous, um, the goal there is, this is the JPL lab, by the way. So Starshade Rendezvous, our goal, it, Rendezvous in French means meet up. And so the idea would be to use the w First telescope, now called the Roman telescope, that would launch in the mid-2020s. And our dream is that we could build Starshade and launch it separately later on, late in this decade. And that Starshade Rendezvous would meet up with w First and Formation Fly, and it would uh, be able to search the nearest 12 sun-like stars for any planets there. If it can find an Earth on the brightest of those, it can get a spectrum. Now, it's a bit of a rocky road, you know, to ask someone, hey, I, I want to use your telescope for Starshade, and it's going to cost um, you probably $30 million to make it Starshade ready, to have a radio where you can talk to Starshade, to have a guide camera where you can acquire the star, the Starshade. So we're not sure where it's going right now. It's not looking as positive as it was, I'll just say. Um, right now, Starshade is the Roman telescope. It's not necessarily going to be kept Starshade ready. But we're all waiting for the United States Decadal Survey to come out. This survey, the astronomers get together every decade and they priority rank order the list of what are the most important projects. So we either need the decadal to rank Starshade Rendezvous Pro highly, or we need them to okay a probe line so that we can write a competitive proposal and try to succeed that way. So although I don't have an answer for you, it's definitely um, somewhat uncertain right now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and moving on to the next question, so we have Eduardo. So, what are the expectations for the next generation of telescopes regarding the effects of stellar activity on exoplanet detection? Stellar activity, right, that's definitely an issue. It could be really tricky with the James Webb Space Telescope because we need multiple transits. You know, we need to bin together 10, even 20, sometimes more if they'll let us transits to try to see a rocky planet atmosphere. So people are worried about con confusion and contamination mm -hmm. and star spots that are cooler that may have molecules that might also be in the planet atmosphere. So it could be a problem, not really sure. Now, if we think of starshade and direct imaging or the 30 meter telescopes, we can block out the starlight. We're not worried about stellar activity at all there because the star is kind of a, is out of the picture basically. Okay, so that's good news for Starshade. Very good news. Okay, moving on to the next question. We have a question from Mariana. So she wants to know a little bit more about these tidal, tidally locked planets. So would it be possible to have an area between the hemispheres, the darkened and the lightened one, where life could develop and survive? Sure, why not? But on these planets, we do expect life to be able to live everywhere, minus those terrible flares that might kill life. Because, you know, even if it's in the darkness, there's life on Earth at the bottom of the ocean that doesn't rely on sunlight to survive. There's hydrothermal vents that give off energy and chemical gradients. 
Also, people make models of planets that are tidally locked, and they show that the energy, although it's all hitting one side of the planet, it circulates around. And as long as the planet has an atmosphere, like a, the thickness of Mars's atmosphere, which it's not a very substantial atmosphere, the energy can be recirculated. So the temperature is not too cold on one side or not too hot on the other side. So yes, you could have life there, but there's no reason for life to not be everywhere. Okay, so great news for life then. Awesome. So moving on to more specific questions about uh, phosphine. So Karim uh, asks that about the, the signal from the ALMA data. So how come there has been a few papers indicating that the authors have gone back to the data and have not found the signal? What's the, the contention based on? I can answer that question, but I first want to say you have to ignore all that data because everybody's got to use the newly recalibrated data that's coming out tomorrow. So whatever I tell you, it's obsolete now because we expect the recalibrated data to have less noise. So it turns out, and again, I'm not a radio astronomer, but in the, in the calibrated but not detrended data, there are ripples. Like there's noise that's sort of like, like a wave, but it's uh, not like a consistent, you know, it's not consistently spread out in frequency. And we did something that definitely isn't common and maybe actually bad, but we used a 12th order polynomial to remove these ripples. And that was bad. What was good, which may be surprising, it was surprising to me, is that in radio astronomy, you remove these ripples and the ripples come from, I'm not even really sure where they come from, but they come from the fact that it's interferometer and the light bouncing off the different surfaces. But um, typically what they do in radio astronomy is they block out the region where they expect the fe spectral feature to be. And then you just remove the, you do the detrending away from the feature you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So people didn't like those two things, using a high order polynomial and this standard radio astronomy practice of chopping out the region where you want the line to be. Now, the original team that I'm part of did that with other parts of the spectrum. So it took random places of the in frequency and said, okay, we're gonna ignore this, this part, remove the ripples with a high order polynomial. And we still didn't, we, uh, didn't find anything anywhere else. We also used the same procedure and we found the uh, deuterated water feature that we expected to be there. Yeah, so that's the specifics. Now okay. other people did other, by the way, this is like a really long conversation. Other people did other things we could complain about, but like I said, ignore all of that and wait till tomorrow. And we don't know if the signal will, will persist, but we'll mm -hmm. wait and see. And after all that, don't forget about the Pioneer Venus data. <laughs> <laughs> that was very cool, by the way, uh, the, that slide. So uh, that's, that's great because you all already answered another question. So Tiago was going to ask about the, the 12 order polynomial. So you, you, you told us about that, but he claims about, he, he also comments on the, the high SN of the detection. So this is a point that's interesting. And this connects with the next question that we have here. So Elio asks if, it, if it's, is it possible to increase still more the signal to noise of the phosphine feature with the current facilities? Yes, Jack, I hope you're on the telescope allocation committee. We <laughs> used very little time. It turns out all that ALMA time was maybe like three hours. It's not huge amounts of time. And on JCMT, it was something similar. So hopefully we can get more telescope time and, and do this job. We're also trying to, not just my group, but other people, trying to observe phosphine in the infrared, hopefully using the Sophia Airborne Observatory. We have data from the IRTF, that's an infrared telescope facility on um, Mauna Kea. But the infrared features, their rotational vibrational spectra, they're quite weak actually. Mm -hmm. So it could take a while to, to get all these different observations. Yeah, okay, so, so you are also trying to detect other features related to phosphine, right? On Venus, you mean, or in general? Yes, on Venus. Like, my group is not specifically right now. I mean, there, there's a very small community that studies Venus's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. One of them, um, Dr. Therese Ankarez, she studies sulfur dioxide, which changes with time. They're trying to figure out why and just monitor it. There's this Russian professor, Krasnopolsky, who, you know how sometimes you read someone's papers and you feel like, wow, I should meet that person. He has like the decades worth of papers looking for some interesting gases like um, chlorine related gases because that's really important for photochemistry. 
Um, but so far, we're not, at least right now, we're not looking for other things, but it's out there for everyone to become a Venus scientist. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, so we have next question here from uh, Edgar. So he thanks you for the talk and asks if you could please comment on other phosphorus bearing molecules in Venus. Well, at the, t the, at the levels that we're interested in, like the clouds of Venus, where this crazy speculation about life, phosphine is the only, to my knowledge, compound that phosphorus would be in gas form at those temperatures. So I, I don't know if that's even right because I haven't thought about these, these other um, gas phosphorus bearing molecules. We typically would expect phosphorus to be in, um, at the surface of Venus in phosphates and maybe a bit of phosphorus acid inside the sulfuric acid droplets. So good question, one that I can't answer right now. Great, perfect. Okay, and there is a question from Ricardo. He, he wants to know a little bit more about methane in, in Titan, but can, can you also expand on this and, and talk about methane in, in general as a biosignature in exoplanets? Sure. People love methane as a biosignature gas because on Earth we have this type of bacteria called methanogens. And some of them live at our deep sea floor. And what they do is they use um, hydrogen, molecular hydrogen that it comes off rocks. Hot water hits the crack of rocks and releases hydrogen from minerals. So it has hydrogen and carbon dioxide, which mixes down from our atmosphere. And it catalyzes a reaction between those and it releases um, water and methane gas. And people think for some reason that early on Earth, we had a lot of methanogens. So methane is a very popular idea, but methane is also produced um, by geology. It turns out, you know, that some of these simple gases like methane, life has the same chemicals to work with that geophysics does. And our mid-ocean ridges also produce methane. So you may have heard of methane on Mars, which is somewhat controversial, but I think it's real. It's in, produced in such tiny amounts, we don't know if it's by some kind of microbes beneath the surface or if it's uh, this process called serpentinization that I described. So methane, unless there's massively huge amounts of it, it's very easy to explain away by a false positive. So Titan has methane and most of these atmospheres shouldn't because of photochemistry, you know, which destroys it. But I think it's a mystery. I don't know why Titan has so much methane and I don't know if anyone knows actually. Yeah, so that I, I really like the, these these talks because we have too many answer, unanswered questions. So lots of things to work and, you know, and you're a great audience because you're asking such questions that don't have answers yet. Yeah, that's that's really cool, right? So, oh, by the way, um, taking the the the, the taking uh, the, the subject that we are on the methane. So. Uh, do you still consider the, 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 the chemical disequilibrium like fi finding methane and oxygen at the same time in an atmosphere as a, as a good hint for the existence of life or, or is, is this is still not the, the, the main, main idea anymore? Well, it kind of, it's not exactly, it depends who you talk to, you know, we all have opinions. And so one thing about that is it would be amazing definitely a great thing if we could see two gases that are highly reactive with each other that shouldn't exist together. A new thing you might not have heard of though is people thought about our Earth as an exoplanet and nowhere in history was there enough of each gas simultaneously for us to, to observe no. for Earth as an exoplanet. So we don't want to put all our hopes on a thing like that because on Earth anyway they never existed together in high enough quantities. Okay. Uh, we have an, another question here, I think it's the last one. So, uh, direct image is usually used for very distant planets and young exoplanets. Could starshade reduce these biases, maybe allowing us to correlate with other methods to get more planet parameters? Yes, exactly. That is the exact goal of starshade. Is right now, as the questioner says, Pedro, we, we really can only see objects that have no solar system counterpart. They're big and hot or far from the star or young or all of those. But yes, the goal of starshade is to be able to detect solar system planets such as Jupiter, Venus, and Earth and Saturn. So it has to do a lot better if you can do the math in your head. <laughs> it's like five orders of magnitude better than what we do right now. Yeah, so that's 
yeah, that's a huge challenge that we'll have in the near future. So I think this brings us to the end of the question. So uh, I just wanted to, to show you, Sarah. So lots of people uh, saying thank you for your talk. So Alini say, says thanks to you. And Mariana, thanks you for your answer. So Diogo also uh, thanks you for the very nice talk. And Pedro, uh, thank you for the talk and Dan for, the, for answering the question. And uh, I would like to, to end up with this uh, comment from uh, Iana. So she says that's an amazing talk. And as a PhD student, so she, she's really inspired to see such important work headed by a female astronomer. So uh, this is a very important message. You, you actually are a great inspiration to, to uh, women in astronomy. You have, a, uh, have this, that great book that's a reference to so exoplanet atmosphere. So you all should take a look if you're interested in learning more details. So your contributions to the field are really amazing, Sarah. So I, I would like to thank you on behalf of Valongo Observatory for uh, being with us today and giving this amazing talk and for all your contributions to the field. Thank you so much. And as we approach the end of the talk, would you like to, to tell us what, in your opinion, what, uh, what's the new what next, what students should be looking for in the near future, for what's the, the next biosignature that your group will focus on, uh, which paths students should, should explore in the near future? Well, there's just so many, I mean, I wanna just encourage you to find something you're good at that you love doing. And there's a lot of different things in exoplanets. You know, there's big data and those people who are great with um, code and looking at tons of data at once. There's people who are better with instrumentation and problem solving. So I think the key is just to find something you're good at that you also love. Uh, so I just answered that because I didn't have an answer to what you said. There's so much happening in exoplanets. It, it would be hard to, to choose just one thing. Okay, but that's a great answer. So that's lots of things to choose. So that's that's perfect too. So people that are, are working on exoplanets, you see that we have a very important astronomer, one of the most relevant astronomers in the field telling you that you have lots of things to explore in the near future. So that's great news. Uh, Sarah, I'll thank you very much again. It was a great honor to have you here with us. And for me personally, a great honor to, to be the host for your talk. And I hope someday, we will be able to invite you to visit us in person here in Rio and at Valongo Observatory. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone. So this brings us to the end of this talk. So thank you very much again for being with us. Uh, don't forget, we are here every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Please check our schedule at our website or on, on our social media and subscribe to our channel to receive the reminders for the next talks. So thank you very much. See you next week. Bye-bye.